people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. Weeks after Sri Lankan Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa resigned from his post in the face of expanding violent anti-government protests, another family member with a cabinet rank, Basil Rajapaksa, has resigned now. The decision may have come as a shot in the arm for the anti-government demonstrators. The ground situation in the country has not shown any signs of improvement with crises ranging from petrol to power to unprecedented price rise everything is seemingly slipping out of government's control the brother of sri lanka's president gotabaya rajapaksa and the country's former finance minister basil rajapaksa has resigned from the parliament the second from the influential family to step away from government amid a severe economic crisis. President Gotabaya Rajpaksa's elder brother Mahinda Rajpaksa had resigned as Prime Minister last month after prolonged protest against the economic crisis turned deadly. The three Rajpaksa siblings have been key players in Sri Lankan politics for decades but are blamed by protesters who have taken to the streets in thousands in recent months for mishandling the island nation's economy. Basil, however, did not concede that he was resigning owing to rising pressure. He said he would continue to remain involved in politics even after the resignation. Sri Lanka Parliament Malay come to matter, Mama Parmin to Mantri Vere Catheater Illa Simeli Uma Baraduna Enisa Memo to Venoita Mama Samania Puravasi Eclesa Uba Amatane Tasakarpe at the May Raja Palnat, the Shapalnat, Kiana de Kakiela. He gets some poor name Raja Palning. Baharavim Tamay me ada Tindue Pradanam Ilake Yanuya de Indala Kisima Raja Palne Kisima Katu Tata Mama Sambandu in Natibaba Danundino Abai Desha Palne, I think Karima Matrakaran. The crisis in the island nation is showing no signs of abating, let alone dying down. From long queues for gasoline to hours of power cuts, the situation is getting grimmer by the day. And after, several government employees took to the streets expressing protest against the incumbent authorities. It was the power sector engineers this time who decided to protest triggering a painful power outage situation where people suffered painfully long power cuts. People in Sri Lanka are already facing massive power shortage and the strike by electricity board employees that is responsible for around 1000 megawatt of electricity further worsened the situation. From morning chores to evening businesses, everything was affected. The only good news that surfaced for the island nation was from the United Nations, which in response to a request from the government, confirmed to have launched a plan to provide 47.2 million US dollars of assistance between June and September. 
The protests, however, in the country have gained momentum as more and more people are joining in. Even after the resignation of Basil Rajapaksa, the demonstrators say they are not satisfied and will only leave the protest sites once all Rajapaksas are gone. Reports are also surfacing about rights between the pro-government and anti-government demonstrators. The law enforcement agencies used tear gas this week on students who blamed the police for dragging their feet in arresting the leaders of President Rajapaksa's party. They said the authorities employed brute force to muzzle their demands. The authorities called it a measure to prevent degradation of the law and order situation. The observers say that similar incidents are likely to occur and reoccur on a frequent basis until the government succeeds in bringing stability at the economic front. They say the government must be focusing now on ensuring investments, securing loans and an increased fuel supply. Moving on, people in Pakistan carried out several demonstrations after the new Shehbaz Sharif government raised petrol prices and power tariffs for the second time in a week. Although Prime Minister has defended his decisions, saying the need of the hour was to prevent country from an economic crisis, the people say their lives have been badly affected and even the daily essentials have become out of their reach. Hundreds of protesters took to the streets of Pakistan's capital Islamabad to protest against the unprecedented rise in petrol prices that have prompted a sudden escalation in the country's inflation rate too. They held banners that labeled the Shahbaz Sharif's administration as imported government and urged it to purchase oil from Russia. Demonstrators said their lives and livelihood were severely affected as everything ranging from the transportation cost to the kitchen staples had become expensive. The current rate in Pakistan, which has gone through a rough political transition in past few weeks, has touched a five-year high. Consumer price index inflation rose to 13.8% in May, year-on-year year, the highest in two and a half years. Adding to the woes, the country's finance minister, Mifta Ismail, said Islamabad would continue to slash fuel subsidies in a bid to control the fiscal deficit and secure international monetary fund bailout money. The protesters also called out government's high-handedness at muzzling their rightful demands. एक के बाद एक पेट्रोल बम गिराया जा रहा है और जिस तरीके के साथ तमाम चीजें महंगी हो रही हैं और आप यकीन करें एक आम आदमी एक गरीब आदमी जो है वो पिस के रह गया है और ना सिर्फ एक गरीब आदमी बल्कि मैं सोचती हूँ कि मिडिल क्लास जो है इस वक्त उसको दीवार से लगा दिया गया है। The government has defended its decision saying the hike in fuel prices was inevitable in order to protect the country from bankruptcy. Only a few days back, the Prime Minister had addressed the nation saying all calls were being made for the welfare of the country and essentially the people of the country.
as per the several sources that have been in direct talks with people involved in negotiations between Pakistan and IMF, both sides have drawn out a plan as per which Pakistan will receive over $900 million of latest tranche if it removes the fuel subsidies. Ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan had given the subsidy in his last days in power to cool down public sentiment in the face of double-digit inflation. Observers, however, say that prolonged high inflation will only trigger more resentment amongst the common people, but also admitted that Islamabad cannot escape the inflation troubles and it will have to take tough calls in order to save its economy from falling into a massive crisis. Moving on, all is not well in Afghanistan and the international community is gradually speaking against it. After the UN Special Rapporteur last week, the German Foreign Minister Annalena Barbock called out the group for changing its position from what was supported during the peace talks. The minister's statements came in the backdrop of Taliban increasing hardline position, especially against women, which has basically snatched away the fundamental right of freedom from them. Since the Taliban seized power last August, Afghanistan was descended into a humanitarian crisis. On one side, a large section of the country's population is not getting enough food and the outbreak of diseases is becoming a common phenomenon. On the other, the Taliban's increasingly hardline stance in controlling the country is pushing Afghanistan towards deeper wars. Dictats suppressing people's freedom, especially those of women, have now caught the attention of the world. After the UN reporter a few days back, the foreign minister of Germany, Annalena Baerbock, called out the group's changing position. Baerbock, who was in Pakistan this week, said the group was heading in the wrong direction and the global community needs to apprise it of its wrongdoings. We see, in my point of view, that the Taliban are heading towards the wrong direction and therefore it is also crucial that economic supports need to be conditionalized with regard to the basic rights of the people. But this is also part of foreign policy. We have to be very honest. Our influence on what happens inside Afghanistan is very limited. It depends on the Taliban making rational choices in their own economic interest. And that is not what they are doing right now. And therefore, we are supporting the people of Afghanistan with humanitarian relief and uh, bringing out those who are endangered by the life. Baerbock, on a visit to Islamabad, also warned of a humanitarian disaster brewing in Afghanistan, adding that it was not the Afghan people's fault that their government was overthrown by the Taliban. Germany and Pakistan have restructured their system for bringing Afghan refugees to Germany via Pakistan to make it faster and that over 14,000 Afghans who are particularly at risk have been able to travel to Germany over the past months. And while most of the observer groups have pulled Islamabad for not doing enough to bring peace in the region, the Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zardari urged the Afghan government to fall in line with the international law and take steps against terrorism. We support a peaceful and prosperous Afghanistan contributing to stability uh, and regional connectivity. It is our hope that the Afghan authorities would be responsive to the international community's expectations regarding inclusivity, respect for human rights for all Afghans, including women, and take effective actions against terrorism. 
Under Taliban, life is growing increasingly unbearable for women in the country. Almost a year into the rule, it has become particularly tough for female scholars and students. For female scholars, life under the Taliban means that all must wear garments that cover their head and body and are restricted from teaching men. And female students cannot attend classes with men and are restricted from being taught by them. And when they try to raise their voices against these repressive measures, they are subjected to brute high-handedness that include a wide range of punishments from public flogging to indefinite jail terms. <laughs> Taliban have also brought in changes in their earlier positions, stating the male members will be blamed and prosecuted if women do not fall in line with what has been ordered or to say what has become a law. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Iraq's historic southern marshes are drying up. Herders here say they have been watching water levels drop in recent months and it's already affecting their animals. The marshlands of Mesopotamia are fed by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers with an entire ecosystem in the area relying on water. But the UN says last year's rainfall season was the second driest in four decades. Nature Iraq says the marsh's water levels are lower this year compared to the same time last year. And the group fears salinity and pollution will keep rising, making it harder for herders to keep their animals healthy. Climate change, pollution and upstream damming have kept Iraq trapped in a cycle of recurring water crisis. Herders say if the water dries up completely, everybody will lose. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese heralded a deepened relationship with Indonesia pledging stronger cooperation on trade, security and climate change during a meeting with President Joko Widodo past week. Albanese stressed the importance of engaging with Southeast Asia's largest economy. The government would work together to realize the potential of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, Albanese said, and also offer technical expertise for the development of Indonesia's new plant new green and high-tech capital, Nuzantara. Albanese also reiterated a $338.6 million pledge for overseas development in Indonesia and Southeast Asia and the creation of a new Southeast Asia office in Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The trip came as Australia's new Labour government, which ended almost a decade of conservative rule in a May 21 election, signalled a greater emphasis on relations with Southeast Asia and climate change, an issue crucial to its specific neighbours as it navigates ties with a more assertive China. Japanese company Rinnai announced the launch of its home hot water heater which utilizes modern technology that burns hydrogen as an energy resource. It is the first heater of its kind. For the event, a press conference was held at the Renai Technical Center in Hokkaido. With the motive of making all its products carbon neutral, Renai declared its Renai Innovation Manifesto 2050. Renai analyzes its all products which emit 1.5% of Japan's CO2 emission. え、ま、カーボンニュートラル宣言ということです。え、リンナイイノベーションマニフェスト2050。この商品開発から製造販売における変革によりまして従来の事業領域の枠を超えてですね、脱炭素社会実現への貢献を目指すというものであります。レネア
Hydrogen is a gas that burns easily. Rinai succeeded in developing hydrogen water heaters with the knowledge gained from Rinai's long history. Hydrogen does not turn into carbon dioxide after burning. Demonstration released to the press shows that there is a colorless flame peculiar to hydrogen. Hydrogen does not turn into carbon dioxide after it gets burnt. Rinai has started demonstration experiment of hydrogen fuel hot water heater in Australia. It aims to complete and prepare shipping to the market. Rinai is aware of one subject. It is hydrogen supply facility. To expand market, it is an integral issue. Rinai Technology hopes that companies and countries all over the world will work towards the direction of producing carbon neutral products. Automobile manufacturer firms participated in an exhibition to learn about the future of automobile industry. Japanese company Nippon Steel produces a number of automotive parts. Nissan has declared Nissan Ambition 2030 to depict the future image of mobility in producing initiatives in electric vehicles, the latest electric motor and driving support technology. Japan is famous for its automobile technology. The technology of Japanese automakers and part manufacturers will contribute to the world's automotive society with clean environment. Moving on, people in India celebrated Ganga Dashera festival on the holy banks of river Ganga. The festival is marked by taking dip in the river and by offering prayers to Hindu deities Shiva and Vishnu. As per Hindu Almanac, Ganga Dashera, also known as Ganga Avtaran, is observed during Dashmi Tithi of Jesh to Shukla Paksh, which usually falls in the month of May or June. Hundreds of thousands of Hindu devotees flock the banks of the holy Ganga River in India during the VRs of Thursday to take a dip in its waters to celebrate Ganga Dashera, which marks the descent of the river from heaven to earth. Devotees were seen celebrating the day in different northern Indian states of Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh, from where the mighty river passes. Ganga Dashera, also known as Ganga Vataran, is observed during Dashmi Tithi of J. Shukla Paksh, which usually falls in the month of May or June. भागरथी ने अथक प्रयास करके वहाँ गंगा को आज के दिन पृथ्वी यानी इतनी उन्होंने भगवान की भजन किया गंगा जो आत्म आना ही पड़ा आज अब आज वो पूरे भारत के अंदर में गंगा जी नीचे आने का सब लोग जितने पुरानी मात हैं उनका उत्सव महोत्सव मना रहे हैं अकॉर्डिंग टू हिंदू गंगा दशहरा मार्क्स द डे वेन गॉड इज गंगा डिसेंडेड ऑन अर्थ आफ्टर सागर डोनेस्टिस किंग बागीरथ एक्सटेंसिवली वर्शिप लॉर्ड ब्रह्म praying for his ancestor's soul to be relieved of their previous curses. Hindus also say that taking a dip in the holy water of Ganga river wash away their sins and purify their souls. After taking dip in Ganga, devotees offer water to sun god. Immerse a betel leaf, flowers and rice in water. Apart from these rituals, one can also immerse earthen lamps on the river. ये से लोग बहुत अच्छे दूर दूर से मनाने आते हैं आज के दिन जो दान पुण्य करता है उसके लिए बहुत ही सौभाग्यशाली है लोग के दुख दर्द कष्ट दूर हो जाते हैं Meanwhile the central Madhya Pradesh state came alive with marigold flower shards as ash smeared ascetics and locals rejoiced while worshiping the Hindu goddess Ganga Holy dips and smearing of colors are by and large the essence of most of the Hindu festivals. Kites are also flown in some parts of the country on the occasion of Ganga Dashera. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.